This is case number IT0475T, the prosecutor versus Goran Hadžić. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the appearances, starting with the prosecution, please. Good morning, uh, Your Honors. Uh, Douglas Stringer appearing on behalf of the prosecution with Laurel Begg, Sarah Clanton, and uh, Colin Narat here uh, helping us with the slides and the videos. Thank you. For defense. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. On behalf of Mr. Goran Hadžić, Zoran Živanović, lead counsel, Christopher Gossin, co-counsel, and Toma Fila, uh, legal consultant. Thank you. Thank you. So we will start the trial with the prosecution's opening statement. Mr. Prosecutor. Thank you, Mr. President, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court and counsel. At the outset, I'd like to describe three incidents from the indictment against Goran Hodgich that demonstrate the violent nature of the crimes committed in this case and their impact on victims, their families, and entire communities. On the 9th of November, 1991, Franjo Pop and his family lived in the hilly countryside outside of a town called Erdut. Erdut is situated on the western bank of the Danube River in the extreme eastern part of Croatia, a region called Eastern Slavonia. On that day, Mr. Pop was among a group of men, ethnic Croats and Hungarians, who were arrested and taken to a military training center in Erdut that was run by a person named Jelko Raznatovic, better known by his nickname, Arkan. Arkan commanded a Serb military unit called the Serbian Volunteer Guard, and they were based at this training center. Franjo Pap, together with at least 11 other prisoners arrested that day, was brutally beaten and killed at the training center. The bodies of most of these men were put into a mass grave in the nearby town of Chelie. Franjo Pap's remains were recovered from a well located outside another town called Dal. This incident alone wiped out the male population of several families. Franjo Pap's son, Mihailo, was among the 12, as were three members of the Colosi family. Anton, Nicola, and his son, also named Nicola. Also killed were Josip, Stepan, Sinashi, father and son, who by marriage were relatives of the Kolozi family. A few days later, Franjo Pop's wife, Juliana, started going around the town looking for her missing family members. She asked too many questions. She was soon arrested in Erda along with her other son, Franjo, and a 20-year-old woman named Natalia Rakin. The three of them were executed, and years later their bodies were exhumed from a well in the nearby town of Borovo Selo. The town of Ilok also sits on the Danube in eastern Croatia, south of Erdut. It was a place where about 6,700 people lived, 92% of whom were Croats, but ethnic Slovaks lived there as well. By mid-October 1991, the entire region where Elok was located had been taken over by Serb armed forces who were destroying the towns and expelling its non-Serb inhabitants. Elok was packed with those who had come from other nearby towns, Tavarnik, Babska, Sharingrad, Lovas. The people in Elok tried to negotiate terms with the representative of the Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, so that they could stay. But in an act that demonstrates the complete hopelessness of their situation, the people of Elok organized a referendum a vote on whether to leave their town altogether. The vote was held on the 13th of October, 1991. 
There were two questions on the referendum. Your honors have it on the screens in front of you, or you should. The first was whether to surrender their weapons and agree to the terms demanded by the JNA. The second question on the referendum was whether to collectively move away altogether. The referendum was held on the 13th of October, 1991. And based on what they saw had happened in the neighboring towns like Tavarnik, Sharingrad, Lovas, the people in Elog voted against accepting the JNA's terms. They voted to leave. Some 8,000 people left Elok in a convoy that was organized by the JNA. <clears throat> Four days after the referendum was held in Elok, a group of about 100 Croat men in the nearby town of Lovas were summoned to the Zadruga building, which was part of a gated complex that served as a community center in Lovas. The town was under the control of the Serb armed forces. The men had been summoned there before and required to perform forced labor. On this occasion, a different form of forced labor awaited them. After they arrived on October 17th, severe beatings took place in the courtyard of the Zadruga complex. Some were singled out for special treatment and they were stabbed and beaten with knives, metal bars, and electrical cables. On the following morning, October 18th, about 50 of the prisoners were called out by name and told to line up in pairs. The group was then marched out of the town to a clover field where mines had recently been placed. The mines had not been put there by Croatian fighters, but rather by the Serb armed forces themselves. One of the prisoners, Boško Bojanac, had already been beaten so badly that he was not able to complete the march down to the clover field. He was shot on the spot and left along the side of the road. <clears throat> when the prisoners reached the field, they were directed at gunpoint to hold hands and walk across, sweeping their legs from side to side in order to locate and disarm the mines that had been placed there. When the first mine exploded, several Serb soldiers began firing at the prisoners in the field. And when it was over, 21 of the Croat men had been killed with more injured. The dead were buried in a mass grave at Lovas. <clears throat> Your Honors, this is the last opening statement of the last trial to be held in this tribunal. But the crimes you'll hear about, such as those I've just described, were among the very first to be committed during the, the long years of conflict and despair that witnessed the death of a culturally rich, diverse country called Yugoslavia. In October and November of 1991, when these crimes I've just des described were committed, Goran Hodžić was the leader of the government of what was called the Serbian Autonomous District of Sl Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Srem, what we'll call the SAO, SBWS. It was Hodgich who'd, who'd provided the training facility to Archon, where the Pap, Kolozi, and Sanashi men, and many other victims in this case, were beaten and killed. Hodgich's government offices were in the same compound as Archon's training center. On Elok, Hodgich was involved in the talks held there between the local population and the JNA before the referendum on leaving was held. And after the town was empty, Goran Hodgich participated in discussions to repopulate Elok with Serbs from other places. 
News of the massacre in the Lovas minefield on 18 October 1991 soon became widely known and documented across the SBWS and beyond. And Hodgich was certainly aware of it. He was in Lovas for a meeting shortly after the incident occurred. Hodgich did nothing about this incident or the many other crimes he knew were taking place. He did nothing to protect the non-Serbs who lived in this region of SAO, SPWS. He approved of the crimes. The crimes of violence and expulsion that the thousands of victims in this case suffered were committed to further a goal shared by the accused, Goran Hodgic, and others the chamber will hear about, to create new territories inside Croatia that would be organized solely along ethnic lines. Your Honors, as we've learned from years of prosecuting and judging the many cases that have preceded this one in this tribunal, the creation of ethnically pure territories in regions that have for generations been ethnically mixed is accomplished through conflict, persecution, and violence, what we now generically call ethnic cleansing, a term that was not yet a part of our nomenclature when the first waves of crime and expulsion drove thousands from their homes and villages throughout eastern Croatia in 1991. The term ethnic cleansing is now, of course, tragically linked to the collapse of Yugoslavia itself in the 1990s, as ethnic cleansing to create territories along ethnic lines spread from Croatia to other places that are now well known to this tribunal and the world. Sarajevo, Priador, Mostar, Srebrenica, Kosovo, just to name a few. But even if it didn't yet have a name at the time, what we call ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia began here in Croatia in late summer and autumn of 1991 in places that are not so well known, places like Erdut, Ilok, and Lovas. The evidence will show that in the pursuit of his ambition to establish an ethnic Serbian state on the territory of Croatia, Goran Hodžić presided over a breathtakingly vicious campaign of persecution, murder, extermination, deportation, forcible transfer, destruction, and plunder that was directed against thousands of innocents whose sole crime was to find themselves as non-Serbs living inside the areas controlled by Hodgic and the Serb forces that supported him. The evidence will show that the crimes were all accepted and employed as part of the joint criminal enterprise that serves as a basis for Goran Hodgic's individual criminal responsibility in this case. I'll speak about the JCE, its membership, and how con Hodgich contributed to it shortly. The evidence will show that Goran Hodgich is also responsible for these crimes based on his role in planning, ordering, and instigating them. He aided and abetted the others who were committing these crimes. For many of the crimes, Hodgich had the ability to prevent them from happening or to bring about investigations and prosecutions of the perpetrators. Hodgich did not use his powers or influence to prevent crimes or bring perpetrators to justice or even to speak out against what was happening. Given his high positions in the Croatian Serb leadership, his acquiescence and acceptance of crimes was itself a form of encouragement. Your Honors, in the next few sections of my submissions, I'll describe a series of important political developments 
that provide the context for the conflict and crimes that would be taking place by August of 1991. I will then describe some of the Serb military units that figure prominently among those that committed the crimes in Croatia during the conflict. And then, before addressing the conflict and the crimes themselves, I will identify several of the members of the Joint Criminal Enterprise and their links to Hodgich and the Serb forces that perpetrated the crimes charged in this case. <clears throat> the widespread lawlessness and brutality that the Chamber will hear about in this case occurred in the context of profound political change that took place in the former Yugoslavia during 1990 and 1991. I would like to mention some of these developments now, those which bear directly on the case, and in particular, which led to the emergence of Goran Hodžić as the political leader of Serbs in Croatia during 1991 to 1993. As your honors know, in 1990, Croatia was one of six republics of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, the SFRY, which had been governed by a single party, the Communist Party, since World War II. In 1990, the communist system gave way as individual republics held multi-party elections. The first of these multi-party elections were held in April and May of 1990 in Croatia and Slovenia. In Croatia, the Democratic, Croatian Democratic Union, the HDZ or HDZ, won more than 41% of the vote, which gave it a majority in the Croatian parliament. At the end of May 1990, that parliament elected Franjo Tuđman to be the president of the presidency of what was still, at the time, the Socialist Republic of Croatia, a part of the SFRY. These events caused unease among ethnic Serbs living in Croatia. Although present in various parts of Croatia in significant numbers, the Croatian Serbs comprised about 12% of the total population of Croatia compared to about 78% of Croats. The remaining members of the population consisted of other ethnic groups. Croatian Serbs were concerned that in this new post-communist Croatia, they could be subject to discrimination or lose political rights that they had enjoyed under the Yugoslav system. During the latter half of 1990, the Socialist Republic of Croatia embarked on a path intended to secure its independence from Yugoslavia altogether. On the 22nd of December, 1990, the Croatian parliament promulgated a new constitution for the Republic of Croatia. Your Honors, I should add, we've all the timeline, the dates that you're seeing uh, should have been uh, compiled onto a single uh, sheet of paper, which you should have. And if you don't have it, we can make sure that you do. But there is a time frame that we can, uh, it's in the court binder, I'm, I'm informed. <clears throat> On the 22nd of December, 1990, the Croatian Parliament promulgated a new constitution for the Republic of Croatia. Under the SFRY constitution, Croats, Serbs, Muslims were among the six constituent nations or peoples of Yugoslavia. The Croatian constitution of December 1990 changed that to define Croatia as the national state of the Croat nation and as the state of members of other nations and minorities. 
Serbs and other ethnic groups were guaranteed equality with citizens of Croat nationality. But in the eyes of some Croatian Serbs, the language of the new constitution demoted them from their previous status as a constituent people to a national minority. <clears throat> On the 21st of February, 1991, Croatia's parliament passed a resolution initiating its disassociation from the SFRY. And on the 19th of May, 1991, a referendum was held in Croatia on independence. And a little over one month later, on the 25th of June, 1991, Croatia officially declared its independence from the SFRY. The Croatian Serbs did not remain idle during this period of profound change in Croatia and Yugoslavia. Going back to the spring of 1990, Goran Hodžić was at that time living in the town of Pacitin, located in Vukovar municipality in eastern Croatia, working as a warehouseman. Your Honors, this map shows Entire, the entirety of Croatia, and the box that you see in the upper right-hand corner is uh, around the area that's of primary interest to us in this case, certainly during the period of 1991. And then the next map actually shows that area that was within the box we've just seen. And your Honor, I'm going to take the mouse here and try to point to a couple of the areas. I don't know if you'll be, be able to see them or not. I hope you do. Um, I've mentioned Vukovar, and Vukovar is the town here located on the Danube River, which in fact forms the boundary between Croatia here and Serbia here. This is the town of Vukovar, and Mr. Hodžić was from this region. Uh, the region I've mentioned, the SBWS, Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Shrem. And this map indicates each of those areas. The Vukovar area is, in general terms, here, known as Slavonia, or more correctly, Eastern Slavonia. Because as we'll hear, there's also a different region to the west that's called Western Slavonia. To the north is the region here, called Baranya, and to the south is the region called Shriem or Shrem. And these are the three regions, if you will, that form the SAO, SBWS, that we'll be discussing in this case. I should mention also Shrem is an ancient administrative unit that's now divided into Western Shrem which is the part in Croatia, and then the eastern part, which is now in Serbia. And we'll talk later about Shremska Mitrovica, but that the reference there to Shrem is, is an indication that this part of, of Serbia was at one time known as Eastern Shrem. <clears throat> In the multi-party elections held in the spring of 1990, Hodžić won a seat on the Vukovar Municipal Assembly, running as a member of the SDP party, or the, the Democratic Party for Democratic Change. However, he soon abandoned the SDP and became active in establishing a different party, the Serbian Democratic Party, or SDS, for the Vukovar region. And that was formed on the 10th of June, 1990. On that day, Mr. Hodgett was elected president of the Municipal Committee for the SDS in Vukovar. Over time, he became active in the SDS leadership for Croatia. While Hodgett and the Serbs in the Vukovar region of eastern Slavonia were organizing themselves, Important developments were taking place among Serbs located in the Kanin-Kraina region to the west and south. 
This is important because the developments in the Kanin Kraina were to serve as a precursor and model for the Hajic led move for Serb autonomy in his own region of eastern Slavonia. Later, the different Serb autonomous areas or districts served as the genesis for what's called the Republic of the Serbian Krajina, the RSK, which Hajic would become president of in 1992. Your Honors, this map indicates the area generally of what was to become the SAO Krajina with the blue borders being an indication of what was the territory declared. And then this will be evidence of one of the upcoming witnesses. The red generally referring to the areas that were under Serb control. So the areas as declared did not uh, totally match with the areas that fell under military control. Um, and essentially uh, the red would indicate the area of confrontation lines. This is the SAO Kraina here, and we'll talk more about this area throughout these submissions. The Kanin Kraina Serbs were led by Milan Babic, who on the 31st of July, 1990, became the president of a body called the Serbian National Council, SNC. And this was to operate as the executive branch of a Serbian assembly which had been established in the Kanin region one week earlier. This assembly had declared sovereignty and autonomy of the Serb people in Croatia one week earlier on the 25th of July, 1990. The Kanin Krajina SAO declared itself as a sovereign autonomous region in Croatia. Within about five weeks time, by the 2nd of September 1990, the SNC had called for and held a referendum for Serbs on autonomy of Serbs inside Croatia. And the Serbs voted overwhelmingly in favor of autonomy, about 97% in favor. On the 21st of December 1990, the Kanin Municipal Assembly adopted a decision establishing what was called the Autonomous Serbian District, or SAO, for Krajina. This decision provided that the institutions of the SAO Krajina would be responsible for the district's proper functioning and that it, the SAO Krajina, would implement the laws of Croatia within that territory. One day after the decision declaring the SAO Krajina on the 22nd of December 1990, as I've already mentioned, the Croatian parliament promulgated the new constitution. Under Milan Babic, the SAO Krajina moved rapidly to establish complete autonomy within Croatia. Separate Parallel institutions, such as the police, were set up to replace the same Croatian institutions. On the 5th of January, 1991, the Executive Council of the SAO Krajina revoked the authority of the Croatian Ministry of Internal Affairs, the MUP, or the police, to operate inside its territory. All remaining links with Croatia were severed on the 1st of April, 1991, when the SAO Krajina Executive Council voted to secede from Croatia. It issued a decision on accession of the SAO Krajina to the Republic of Serbia. <clears throat> In early 1991, Hajic and the Serbs in the region of Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Shrem began taking similar steps to establish their own separate parallel Serb structures and ultimately a wholly autonomous Serb territory there. 
A few moments ago, I mentioned the Serbs of the Kanin Krajina had formed a Serb National Council, or SNC, on the 31st of July, 1990, which served as an executive body for a Serb assembly. On the 7th of January, 1991, a group of Serbs, including Goran Hadzic, formed the same body, the SNC, for the SBWS region. A separate Serb police force was later established in Borovo Selo, a town we'll see on the map soon. This was a majority Serb town located about 10 kilometers north of Vukovar. Goran Hodžić appointed a Serb to be in charge of the new Serb police force in Borovo Selo. <clears throat> the creation of separate Serb and Croat police and security forces, both in the Kinin region and the Vukovar area, is an extremely important development. As we will see, the first armed conflicts that occurred in the war between the Serbs and the Croats in Croatia involved police units. Second, the evidence will show that these newly created Serb police and security units were financed and equipped by the Republic of Serbia. On the 26th of February, 1991, the SBWS Serb National Council, the SNC executive body, issued a declaration on the sovereign autonomy of the Serb nation of Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Shrem. This provided that the Serb people in that area would exercise sovereign autonomy through supreme legislative and executive power in relation to specified issues of autonomy, including the protection of peace and security. The SBWS government structures came into being on the 25th of June, 1991. This is a day of tremendous importance. As we've already noted, it was on this day that the Croatian parliament declared Croatia to be independent from Yugoslavia. International recognition of Croatia was not to come for another six months, but the lack of official recognition from outside does not appear to have had any effect on the events that were now taking place inside Croatia. On the same day that Croatia de declared its independence from Yugoslavia, Serbs from the region of Slavonia Baranja and Western Shrem met at a place called Bačka Palanka, located on the Serbian side of the Danube River, not far from Vukovar. There, the Serbs of the SBWS voted to secede from Croatia. They created a legislative body called the Grand or the Great National Assembly, which then issued a decision on the position of the Serb people from SBWS, essentially declaring that the Serbs in that territory had, to de had decided to remain within a single country along with the other parts populated by Serbs and other Yugoslav nations which want to live in a united Yugoslav state. It declared that the Yugoslav constitution would continue to apply in this territory. Also, your honors, it was on the 25th of June, 1991, that Goran Hadzic was designated to be the president of the government of the SBWS, its prime minister, if you will, or chief executive. Goran Hadzic was officially appointed to that position, president of the government. Three months later, on the 25th of September, 1991. But the evidence will show that as Prime Minister designate, Hodgich exercised his authority well in advance of his formal appointment on the 25th of September.
Your Honors, this slide <clears throat> is Article 4, shows Article 4 of the 25th of June, 1991, decision on the position of the Serb people of the SBWS that I just referred to. Citizens who live on the territory of Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Shrem are equal in their rights and duties, and they have the same protection before state and other bodies, regardless of their race, language, sex, nationality, religion, etc. Your Honors, the evidence is going to show that this was absolutely, tragically, not true. Within a few short months after the adoption of this declaration, certain citizens found that they not only had no protection for official bodies of the SBWS, but that they, in fact, were the target of this so-called state of SBWS. It soon became open season in Slavonia, Baranja, and Western Shrem on anyone who wasn't a Serb. Croats, Hungarians, Slovaks who lived in the region were targeted for persecution, violence, forcible eviction, and were murdered in large numbers as the SBWS was cleansed of its non-Serb population. Even Serbs who protested against the persecution of their non-Serb neighbors were driven out. The evidence will show that in the months and years that followed the 25th of June, 1991, Goran Hodgic used his positions of leadership in the Serb-held territories of Croatia to facilitate and encourage the violent persecution and forcible, trans forcible removal of Croats and other non-Serbs from the SBWS territory. This was a goal that he shared with others in the joint criminal enterprise that is charged in the indictment. <clears throat> Your Honors, coming back now to this map, this shows the locations of the SAO Kraina, as I had previously mentioned. And now the location of the SBWS, SAO, again with the blue being the area declared, red being the evidence will show the area actually held. A third SAO, which I have not yet mentioned, is the SAO Western Slavonia, which was declared in August of 1991. That's in this area, in the middle of the northern section of Croatia. Goran Hodges did not play a significant role in establishing the SAO Western Slavonia, but your honors will hear evidence regarding relevant events and developments that took place there during the latter part of 1991 and after. These three SAOs existed separately in Croatia for only a sh fairly short period. On December 19th of 1991, the SAO Kraina, which was, was just nine months earlier, had voted to secede from Croatia, purporting to join Serbia, now declared itself to be a fully independent state, the Republic of the Serbian Kraina, or RSK. On the 26th of February, 1992, the other two SAOs that we've seen, SBWS and Western Slavonia, joined the RSK. And on the same day, 26th of February, 1992, Goran Hodgic became the president of the Republic, the president of the RSK. He would remain in that position to the end of 1993. The establishment of the three SAOs by the summer of 1991 
claimed territory in Croatia that was to be autonomous Serb territory. But at that time, not everyone shared the same vision of what life would be like inside the SAOs for the people, Serbs and non-Serbs alike, who lived there. The evidence will show that for some, the establishment of SAOs was an attempt to preserve Serbian identity, culture, language, such as the Cyrillic script, within the framework of a new Croatia. For others, however, the vision was much different, much more extreme. They saw the SAOs as largely mono-ethnic territories for which there would be no place for non-Serbs. In order to achieve this vision, populations would have to move. People would have to be driven out, others brought in. Ultimately, this was the vision that prevailed. This brings us to the common criminal purpose of the joint criminal enterprise charged in this case. Your Honors, the evidence will show that a group of people, among whom is this accused, Goran Hodzic, intended to make the SAOs in Croatia as mono-ethnic, as Serbian, as possible. They knew and accepted that to achieve this goal, the non-Serb populations would have to be removed, and that this could only be done by force and by making life so difficult and miserable for those not yet forcibly removed that they would have no choice but to leave. The evidence will show that for Goran Hodzic, the focus was on securing the removal of the non-Serb population from the territory of the SAO, SBWS, during roughly the months of August through December 1991. Hodzic continued to contribute to this goal throughout the combined territory now of the RSK as its president during 1992 and 1993. Through his high-level positions in the Croatian Serb leadership and through his close association with the leadership of the Republic of Serbia, Hodzic made multiple contributions to the JCE. And I'd like to identify a few of those now. I'll return to this in greater detail later as we discuss specific ev events after the conflict began. First, Hodzic was a formulator and implementer of discriminatory policies. Goran Hodzic established and led government bodies which formulated and implemented policies that discriminated against non-Serbs, ensuring that they, would, they were expelled from the area and would not return. Discriminatory measures enacted by the governments under Hodzic's authority included the appropriation of Croatian state assets, as well as abandoned private property, that is, property left behind by the people who no longer live there, enabling his government to seize the property of non-Serbs. Under his authority, the RSK enacted legislation permitting the resettlement of only those people who had a clean war record and had not collaborated with the enemy. Legislation intended to restore the pre-World War II ethnic composition of certain areas was also passed in order to promote the return of Serbs who had left these areas during the World War II era. There was also a decision banning all Croatian citizens from entering the RSK. These measures were discriminatory and were intended to ensure non-Serbs would leave and that those who had already left or been expelled would not return. Hodzic was a coordinator. Using his position of authority, Goran Hodzic contributed and facilitated the work of the local Serbs and militias 
with that of military units arriving from Serbia and ensured that his government ministers did so as well. I will talk about the various Serb forces that committed the many crimes charged in this case. Goran Hodžić was the civilian leader of the SBS, SBWS government and later the RSK. And in those capacities, he served as an important connection between civilian authority and the various Serb armed forces. He was fully engaged in military discussions, planning, and operations. As I'll mention later, the evidence will show that certain Serb forces or units and their military commanders were integrated within Hodžić's civilian government. Goran Hodžić was a supplier. The evidence will show that Hodžić contributed to the JCE by using his position of authority to ensure that the Serb forces operating in Croatia had the resources, materials, and weapons they needed to take control over the territory they claimed for the SAO SBWS. For materials, weapons, and money, the SBWS was completely dependent on Serbia and the continued support of its leadership. The evidence will show that Goran Hodžić was frequently in Belgrade, meeting with Serbian leaders and working to procure weapons for the Serb forces operating in the SBWS. The few assets available locally, whether privately owned or former property of the Croatian Republic, those were also appointed and used to the same end. Hodžić was an implementer of Serbian policy. Hodžić's trips to Belgrade weren't just about obtaining money and weapons. He also went there to receive instructions and guidance and to consult with key figures in Serbia's leadership, who not only shared his goal of creating ethnic Serb territory in Croatia by violence, but also who had the money and the power to make it happen. Hodžić needed them precisely because they had the money, power, and know-how to make the plan a reality. They needed Hodžić because he was a Serb from Croatia whom they could influence or control to ensure that their policies in Croatia would be implemented. First in the SAO SBWS and then in the RSK Goran Hodžić was Slovenan Milosevic's man on the ground in Croatia. President Milosevic and the Serb leadership needed Hodžić not only to implement their policies on the ground in Croatia, but also to ensure that their policies and decisions would be carried out in dealings with the international community. From the very earliest days of the conflict, Hodžić was the face of the SAO, SBWS, and later the RSK in international meetings and negotiations concerning the conflict in Croatia. The evidence will show that as early as September 1991, Goran Hodžić was involved in negotiations with the EU, which was trying to broker a ceasefire. The Dutch ambassador to France, Henry Winans, led negotiations and met with Hodžić in the town of Borovo Selo. After consulting with Slobodan Milosevic, Hodžić signed the ceasefire agreement on behalf of Croatian Serbs. That's an agreed fact, Your Honors. The following month, October of 1991, Hodžić ha traveled here to The Hague for more talks. And the, the trial chamber will have evidence of that. We'd now like to put up a short video clip from early 1993. This is taken just before Goran Hodžić flew out to New York for talks there on the Vance Owen peace plan. 
Here he expresses the view that the only solution is for there to be a border between the Serbian and Croatian people. In this footage, Mr. Hodgic is accompanied by Mile Paspal, who at the time was president of the RSK assembly. Question, what are your expectations regarding the dialogue in New York in the open, upcoming days? Goran Hadzic, I expect a constructive dialogue, but I also expect we will be put under some pressure. We are prepared for that, and we are also ready to tell to the core chairman and to the whole world the truth about the Serbian people and the only possible solution, and that is the border between the Serbian and the Croatian people, which would secure a lasting peace in this area. The trial chamber will have evidence of many meetings and negotiations that Hodgich had with members of the international community from 1991 through 1993. Hodgich's recognized role on the international stage undoubtedly gave him tremendous influence and provided him with a real opportunity to contribute to the restoration of order and the prevention of ethnic-based crimes. The evidence will show that during the course of his many meetings and negotiations with members of the international community, Hodgich was repeatedly confronted with the allegations and evidence of ethnic cleansing and expulsion of non-Serbs. He did not use his influence to stop these crimes or even attempt to do so. The evidence will show that Goran Hodgich had no regard for the plight of non-Serbs living within the Serb-controlled areas under his authority. Hodgic was a direct participant in crimes. Goran Hodgic was not merely a bystander observing or turning a blind eye to the crimes occurring around him. The evidence will show that he directly participated in and facilitated crimes against non-Serbs. Together with other JCE members, he planned the mass expulsion of non-Serbs from the area under his authority to Croat-controlled territory. He personally ordered the unlawful detention of non-Serbs and released detainees into Archon's custody. As I will discuss in further detail, following the fall of Vukovar, he personally ensured that at least 200 Croat prisoners remained in the SBWS and were not moved out to Serbia. And shortly I'll describe what happened to those prisoners. Hodgic was a fueler of persecutory environment and a creator of an environment of impunity. Finally, throughout the indictment period, Goran Hodgic repeatedly and publicly proclaimed that Serbs and Croats could not live together fueling the persecutory and coercive atmosphere that encouraged or forced non-Serbs to flee. He remained mute in the face of certain knowledge of persistent ethnic-based crime that was occurring on his doorstep, creating an environment in which those committing the crimes in the area under his authority knew that they could do so with impunity and were encouraged to commit more crimes. The evidence will show that by all his acts and his omissions, Goran Hodgic contributed to the criminal purpose which he shared with his fellow JCE members. That purpose was the violent removal of non-Serbs from the areas of Croatia perceived to be Serb territory. Now a few words about the Serb forces that I've been referring to. The evidence will show that the dirty work was done by a number of different military units and organizations. Some of these were local units, 
Others came from Serbia. Sometimes these units worked separately. Other times they worked together. But at all times, the Serb forces, as they're defined in paragraph 11 of the indictment, were fulfilling the task of ridding the SAO of its non-Serb population. I'd like to briefly describe here just a few of the, non -Ser of the Serb forces that the Chamber will have evidence about in this case. After that, I'll talk more about the individuals, other members of the JCE, who are most closely associated with these Serb forces. The Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, was at the outset the army for all of Yugoslavia. That was its constitutional role. As Yugoslavia began to fall apart, however, the JNA's role changed. The evidence will show that after the Serbs and Croatia declared their independence, the JNA was gradually transformed. By mid-1991, the evidence will show that the JNA was essentially a Serb army whose mission was to protect Serbs outside Serbia. The evidence will show that for the JNA, the protection of Serbs in Croatia meant intervening militarily to remove Croatian institutions, authorities, and armed forces from Serb majority areas. But it soon went beyond that. The evidence will show that the JNA was among those Serb forces that directly participated in the cleansing of large numbers of non-Serb civilians all across the SBWS, including areas where Croats, not Serbs, were far and away the largest ethnic group. The role played by the JNA in ELOC, which we mentioned at the beginning of our submissions, this is an example of this. The transformation of the JNA from a Yugoslav People's Army to a Serb army involved in ethnic cleansing of non-Serbs in Croatia was carried out by JCE members who were in the JNA and Serbian leadership, such as Generals Kadjevic and Adzic and with the support of Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic. The Serbian Volunteer Guard, SDG, was led by Archon Jelko Rajnatovic. The SDG were also called the, called the Arkanotsi, Archon's Men, or Archon's Tigers. Archon and the SDG were sent to Dal in the SBWS by Jovica Stanisic, who was chief of the Serbian State Security Department, or the DB. Serbia's state security and Ministry of Defense continued to sponsor this unit, the SDG, ensuring that it was well equipped with weapons and ammunition. By August of 1991, Archon's men were installed at the training center facility in Erdut, made available to them by Goran Hodzic. This was the training center where the men of the Pop, Kolozi, and Sanashi families were taken in November 1991, beaten and killed. The training center was within the same gated compound as the seat and offices of Goran Hodzic's SBWS government. After 1991, Archon's men moved to the Kaninkraina region of the RSK, and they fought there in 1992, before moving south to participate in the conflict after it spread to Bosnia-Herzegovina. The evidence will show that local Serbs within the SAOs in Croatia organized themselves into militias or territorial defense forces that participated in the expulsion of non-Serbs from the areas they controlled. In this, they worked in tandem with units from the JNA 
that were not from the area. And they participated in many crimes and expulsions. The commander of the local territorial defense for the SBWS was not a local. Radovan Stojicic, known as Baja, was sent from Serbia to take command of the SBWS TO, territorial defense. Later, when Hodgic was president of the RSK, RSK units of territorial defense were transformed into special police units. And these RSK police units played a key role in crimes committed during 1992 and 1993. The Serbian National Security, or SNB, was a special police unit that provided personal security for Goran Hodžić and his SBWS government. The evidence will show that the members of the SNB committed numerous crimes and killings of non-Serbs in the SBWS, and they frequently collaborated with Archon and his men in this. Serb forces that were active committing crimes in the SBWS in 1991 also included many volunteers who were sent from Serbia. Several nationalist political parties in Serbia formed volunteer units and dispatched them to Croatia. <clears throat> Among these, Vojislav Šešel organized his own volunteers, commonly referred to as Chetniks or Šešel's men. Šešel, who's here at this tribunal awaiting the judgment in his own case, was the leader of the Serbian Chetnik movement and the Serbian radical party, the SRS. Šešel held extremist views on ethnic separation and restoration of a greater Serbia that would encompass substantial parts of Croatia as well as Bosnia-Herzegovina. <clears throat> the Serbian Ministry of Defense <coughs> excuse me, was heavily involved in the organization of volunteers and in their training, equipping, arming for deployment to Croatia. The JNA incorporated volunteers from Serbia in its operations in Croatia. <clears throat> the Red Berets were a special unit that was formed, financed, and equipped and deployed by the Ster Serbian State Security the DB. <clears throat> this unit also participated in crimes against non-Serbs. This unit was known also as Frankie's Men for its commander, <clears throat> JCE member Franko Samadovic. This unit had bases in Tikvesh and Elok. <clears throat> <coughs> Apologies. <clears throat> and was active in, S in the SBWS and in other parts of Croatia. <clears throat> this unit participated in the takeover of Vukovar and killed five non-Serbs in Grabovac, which is one of the incidents in this indictment charged in paragraph 37. <clears throat> Your Honors, here I'd like to speak about a few of the more prominent JCE members that are charged in the indictment as being part of the common criminal purpose with Goran Hodžić. <clears throat> Slobodan Milosevic was the president of the Republic of Serbia and the most powerful figure in the JCE. During the relevant times in this case, Milosevic controlled all major decisions and institutions of the Serbian government. Through his position, he was able to exercise control over and influence Serbian forces, such as its MUP and the JNA. 
This made him, in all likelihood, the most powerful person in the former Yugoslavia <clears throat> during the indictment period 1990 to 1993. His dominance was built on manipulation of Serbian nationalist policies, the essence of which was that Serbs must live in a territory controlled by Serbs. He surrounded himself with loyal supporters. Hodgic and other JCE members rallied around Milosevic and shared his nationalistic sentiments of Serbian unity and ethnic separation. <coughs> Jovica Stanisic was the chief of the State Security Department, the SDB, the Republic of Serbia. This was a part of the Serbian MUP, Ministry of Internal Affairs. He was formally appointed to this position in December of 1991, but he exercised de facto authority over the DB in the months preceding his formal appointment. <clears throat> Franko Samadovic, also known as Frankie, was his deputy. As your honors know, the trial of Mr. Stanisic and Samadovic in this tribunal is in its final stages. Stanisic and Samadovic controlled and coordinated the arming, training, and deployment of volunteer formations in the SBWS, SA Ukraina, and later in the RSK. Archon's Tigers and the Red Berets were among these. <clears throat> In my first remarks, I mentioned the people of Eloc who'd voted to leave rather than stay, and the involvement of Boran Hodzic in discussions about resettling Serbs there. The discussions were held in Stanisic's hometown of Bachka Palanka, which is located on the other side of the Danube River, directly opposite Eloc. Jovica Stanisic was present with Hodzic when this was discussed in late October or early November of 1991. <clears throat> Mikhail Kertis was another Belgrade-based member of the JCE. He was a member of the Serbian <clears throat> presidency in 1989 and 1990 and was president, sorry, deputy federal minister for internal affairs in Serbia in 1992. The evidence will show that Curtis provided weapons, logistical and financial support to Serbian special police and paramilitary units that were operating in Croatia. His sphere of responsibility involved looking after the interests of Serbs outside Serbia, especially in Slavonia and in the Krajinas. Curtis was closely associated with Stanisic, Samadovic, and Milosevic. <clears throat> I've mentioned Jelko Rajnatovic, Archon. He was the commander of the Serbian Volunteer Guard, also known as Archon's Tigers. <clears throat> the evidence will show that Archon was dispatched to the SBWS by Jovica Stanisic, who, as I mentioned, was the head of Serbia's DB state security. Archon is one of the core JCE members with whom Goran Hodzic collaborated in this case. Archon was a known criminal even before 1991 and is a notorious perpetrator of crimes committed in this case. By August of 1991, SBWS Prime Minister designate Goran Hodzic had installed the SAO SBWS government at a winery facility in Erdet. Inside the compound was Archon's training center, which I've already referred to. Many prisoners were brought to, the, brought to the training center for interrogations and beatings before being killed. As indicated here, how when the conflict spread to Bosnia from Croatia, Archon and his unit fought in Bosnia-Herzegovina 
He was indicted by this tribunal, but he was never tried. He was assassinated in Belgrade in January of 2000. <clears throat> Archon and his men also participated in joint actions with the JNA throughout the SBWS. JNA General Andrea Bjorcevich was commander of the 12th JNA Novi Sad Corps in November of 1991. And that unit directly participated in the JNA's operations, was a part of the JNA's operations in the SBWS. We're going to play a short video clip that was taken in 1992 in which Bjorcevich is speaking. And after referring to the destruction of Vukovar, which we'll be getting to shortly, Bjorcevich praised Archon and the tactics they employed together in their joint operations. <laughs> of our own initiative, we did what we did. But we would not have destroyed it to the extent that we did had they decided to surrender. But they didn't want to surrender. And secondly, the men did not want to charge, you know. You can go about attacking using equipment to no end, but if you don't have a man who will seize it, that's the greatest merit of Archon's volunteers. Some are imputing, however, that I am uh, acting in collusion with paramilitary formations. Those are not paramilitary formations here. Those are men who have come voluntarily to fight for the Serb people. We encircle a village, he storms in, and whoever doesn't want to surrender, he kills off, and we move on. Your Honors, the, um, the other gentleman shown in the video on the other side of the woman uh, is, is uh, uh, Archon. We'll have more images of him soon. In this video, General Bjorcevich describes the general role played by the JNA during its operations in the SBWS. With its superior military capability, the JNA would first attack and break the defense of the targeted town or village or surround it. It would then step back while units such as Archon's men, local TOs, or volunteers stepped in to do the mopping up. This alone tells us much about how different Serb forces worked together. But Archon did not just kill enemy soldiers who refused to surrender. In this video, an, Archon, an interview that Archon gave in English in late 1991, probably in September, to French television, Archon describes his policy on the treatment of prisoners generally. Don't be shy. Don't take any more prisoners. We're going to kill every fascist soldier we catch. They have to know that. No prisoners. No prisoners, because they took two prisoners, our prisoners. This is a 19 years, 19 years old soldier who was captured by the fascist Croatian army, Ustashe, and he was tortured till death. We can't forget about the past when 33 members of my family were killed in the Second World War. Uh, tortured like my soldier was tortured like this. The evidence will show that when Archon, what Archon said, when he said that he doesn't take prisoners, it wasn't just soldierly bravado for the camera here. He was telling the truth. And this is not just limited to Croat soldiers. Archon did not distinguish between soldiers, prisoners, or civilians. They were all treated the same. The only distinction that he made was between Serbs and non-Serbs. This next slide is from a JNA report about Archon's training program. This is a report from the 25th of October, 1991. Through the training process, 
of each volunteer, they learn when raiding into a Croatian house to kill whomever they find in the house, no matter if those are children, old, and frail people, women, and similar. They train them to open fire from left to right when engaged in the killings. The evidence will show that after Archon arrived in Erdut in August of 1991, he became a close associate of Goran Hodzic. They were frequently together. This is a still photograph taken from a video from the early part of November 1991 at the funeral of General Mladen Bratic. He had been the commander of the JNA 12th Novi Sad Corps. He was killed in combat operations near Vukovar. The incident charged in paragraph 24 of the indictment is an example of the close collaboration, the criminal collaboration between Hodzic and Archon. The evidence will show that on the 21st of September 1991, Hodzic and Archon together, accompanied by 12 of Archon's men, went to the Dow police station where a group of prisoners was being held. Hodzic had ordered that these prisoners be brought to the police headquarters about one week earlier on the pretense they were to stand trial. Hodzic and Archon released two of the men. Eleven others were taken away by Archon. We know his policy on prisoners. They were executed. And in 1998, the remains of nine of those 11 were exhumed from the village of Chelier and from a well in Dal. Another member of the joint criminal enterprise in this case is Radovan Stojicic, also known as Baja. Like Archon, he was not a local, but rather was from Serbia, where he was a high-level official of the Serbian MUP, or Interior Ministry. He arrived in Erdut around August 1991 and took command of the local TO, Territorial Defense Units. The evidence will show that Stojicic was in regular contact with Hajic and Arkan. Also, Stojicic was in frequent, virtually daily contact with the command of the JNA Novi Sad Corps and he coordinated joint actions of the JNA <clears throat> with the TO units that he commanded. Also, Stojicic, Baja, attended certain meetings of the SAO-SBWS government, and he briefed its members on the military situation on the ground. Milan Martic was a police officer from Kinin who served as its chief of police. During 1991, he was appointed to various high positions in the SAO Kraina, such as Secretary of Internal Affairs, Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior. In August of that year, 1991, he was also named Deputy Commander of the TO, the SAO Kraina. After the SAO SBWS, and Western Slavonia joined the RSK in February of 1992. Martic served as the Minister of Interior while Goran Hodzic was RSK president. Martic was in charge of the police, which included not only regular police units, but also heavily armed special police militias that were involved in many crimes committed against non-Serbs during 1992 and 1993. In 1994, Mr. Martic became president of the RSK. Based in part on his role in crimes committed against non-Serbs in the SAO Kraina and RSK, Milan Martic was indicted by this tribunal in 2003. In 2008, he was convicted and sentenced to 35 years imprisonment. Although he's not identified as a JCE member in the indictment, 
I would like to mention Stevo Bogic, also known as, known as Yayo. Bogic was a Serb from Vukovar, appointed by Goran Hodžić to head a unit called the Serbian National Security, the SNB. The SNB is among the Serb forces that are identified in paragraph 11 of the indictment. The SNB was a special police unit that provided personal security for Goran Hodžić and his SBWS government. Stevo Bogic's office was located in the center at the Erdit Winery Complex, some 10 meters away from Goran Hodžić's office. He reported directly to Hodžić. The evidence will show that members of the SNB committed numerous crimes and killings of non-Serbs in the SBWS, and they frequently collaborated with Archon and his men. Bogic provided Archon's men with SNB identification cards to ensure their free movement in the area. Bogic was also a minister in the SBWS government and later was a minister in the RSK government. Your Honors, I would note here that with Archon and his training center, with Archon and his training center based in the same physical location as Hodgich's SBWS government, with Stevo Bogic of the SNB working just down the hall, and with Radovan Stojicic briefing Hodgich's SBWS government on the actions of the various JNA and TO formations, Hodgich had ensured that civilian government structures of the SBWS would be well integrated with the military structures operating there. Your Honors, we've now described the establishment of the SAOs, the Serbian Autonomous Districts or Regions in Croatia, the common criminal purpose of the JCE and Hodžić's contribution to it, as well as some of the more prominent Serb forces and JCE members. I would now like to address the armed conflict and the various crimes about which the trial chamber will hear during the trial. First, I'd like to mention the beginning of the armed conflict. Your Honors, the evidence will show that the armed conflict began during the period of late March to early May 1991, when units of the newly created Serb MUP, or police, clashed with their counterparts on the Croatian side. A significant conflict took place on the 31st of March 1991 at a place called Plitvice in central Croatia. And here, Your Honors, see a map of Croatia with the location of the Plitvice National Park indicated. <clears throat> Hundreds of armed Croatian MUP personnel were brought into the area in late March of 1991 to restore Croatian control there. That's because the park was in, was in, was, excuse me, within the territory of what had been declared to be the SAO Kraina. The Croatian MUP personnel there encountered armed police units of the SAO Kraina. The JNA was also present and intervened. A ceasefire was agreed. Several police personnel were wounded in the incident. <clears throat> The evidence will show that at the time of the incident at Plitvice, Goran Hodžić was one of the SDS leaders for the areas of Kinin and Vukovar. He and other members of the SDS leadership had come for a conference in Benkovac to the south. While traveling back to the Vukovar area, Hodžić and another Serb political figure, Borovoj Savić, were arrested by the Croatian authorities and they were detained. Hodžić was beaten and mistreated while he was in the custody of the Croatian authorities. He was released after several days. 
There will be evidence that after his arrest and mistreatment at Plitvice, Hodzic became more extreme in his politics and in his views about relations between Serbs and Croats in Croatia. If there had been two visions for the SAOs in Croatia, preservation of Serbian culture and identity within Croatia versus complete separation and establishment of autonomous ethnic Serb territory in Croatia. Hodzic was definitely in the latter camp after Plitvica. His orientation shifted to Belgrade. And by June of 1991, Hodzic would inform one of his more moderate colleagues in the SDS that he, Hodzic, was going to war. The evidence will show that Goran Hodzic held the view that Serbs and Croats could not coexist. This wasn't just his personal opinion. This was to become the policy of his government. Croats were to be driven out and not permitted to return. Your Honor, I can address one more incident and then uh, just another page of my outline and then it would be a good time for a break if you're <clears throat> After Plitvice, a significant armed conflict between Croats and Serbs occurred much closer to home. I've already mentioned Borovo Selo, a Serb town located a short distance north of Vukovar. This map, Your Honors, indicates the location of Borovo Selo in eastern Slavonia. And again, with the mouse, we've already got the arrow there. Your Honors can see Vukovar here, and then the town of Borovo just to the north. Here's Dal, here's Erdet. <clears throat> By May of 1991, the Serbs in Borovo Selo, like many Serbs in many parts of Croatia at the time, had erected barricades to isolate the town and prevent Croatian personnel, such as the police, from entering. Here's a photo that gives an idea of what barricades looked like at the time. On the 2nd of May, 1991, the Croatian authorities sent five buses of Croatian police into Borovo Selo. This was in response to the arrest of two Croatian police officers previous evening. The result was a battle between the Croat police on one side and local Serbs together with volunteers of the Serbian Radical Party, the SRS, Shechel's people, who were also present in Borovo at the time. Twelve Croatian policemen and three Serbs were killed at Borovo Selo during that incident on the 2nd of May, and more were wounded. Your Honor, if this is a good time for a break. I see we're at about 10.30. Thank you, Mr. Poskovic. So we will break now and come back at 11 o'clock. All rise. Vive le vie.